Guys, Tiffy here with Fitbully TV. The question we're gonna we're, we're gonna discuss is when do you quit? When do you let this all go? When do you give up? When do you stop? Especially if you're not ahead. Now, if we're being honest, do you ever really get ahead in the dog space, or does it ever feel like you're getting ahead in anywhere in life? Uh, I had some conversations with some people recently, and some people are are really questioning if they should stay in this. You guys keep calling it a dog game, but games are to be played. And in this case, some people look like they're winning. But I assure you, the struggle, unfortunately, is very real. So when you're managing your kennel, your dog business, the dog opportunity, the dog game, you say, I don't, it looks like it's capped. It looks like it's dying. It looks like it's falling apart. It looks like it's failing. Maybe even you feel like you're failing. And these are the things that people don't discuss or you don't see on social media because social media does what? It highlights subjectively what is perceived all these great and good things. And unfortunately, people like myself, Ruben, Chris Moore, we get the, uh, we'll just say honest phone calls where people are really looking at poking holes in what they're doing and what they're not doing and how they could be better. So let's, let's just get to it. When should you stop breeding dogs well if you never had a breeding plan you never were going to breed dogs and truly be successful and maybe you were one of the people who were super good at sales so despite having no knowledge about really breeding or taking care of the dog you were able to sell dogs in a time of crisis you know what crisis is it's covid 20 covid 2020 or 2019 i don't even know what it is uh, covid <laughs> is when people we're vulnerable. Two times people don't care about cost in life often are at weddings and funerals. You can sell them anything because they're in the most, they're in a heightened state of emotion and they're not thinking clearly. Well, during COVID time when people are sitting at home, they need something to do. A dog looked very appetizing. People were saving money because guess what? I'd imagine when they looked at even the bills on going out, they go, golly, how much were we eating out? How much were we doing this? Now we can't even go nowhere for a solid 90 days. There are people who probably saved three, four, five, ten thousand dollars depending on who they were just in those 90 days because there were no moves to be made. There was no traveling taking place. There were no family function. There were no school programs. Sometimes we forget that kids are very expensive. And um, I went to a high school even where the first time I experienced coming from the not so great part of town, you had to buy your books. It's like, hey, that book's 80 bucks. I had to buy the book to, to go to class and we ain't in college. Yes, sir. Well, I'm 200 in on books. Neither here nor there. Point is this. When do you quit in the dog space? First, I would tell nobody to, to ever quit unless you have no plan. I would say you might want to find something else to be passionate about. Two, if you get into or if you got in here and you were thinking, hmm, I'm going to make all this money. Uh, guys, let me be very clear. Uh, I've spent more money than I've made, and I'm going to spend a lot more money than I make uh, off these dogs. They cost me everything. They cost you your mental peace. They cost you strife every time an ailment shows its hand, a.k.a. loss of skin, inflammation in the face. I've got a friend who's dealing with a dog that has cancer. They drained the tumor and the tumor came back. If you go to the doctor for, for one bill and it's 600, the next one's 500, there's normally no bill less than 150. That goes on for two to three months and sometimes two to three years. If you're dealing with these type of problems within your first three years, what do you think the next six are gonna be like? It just gets more expensive. So if you got into this under the presumption to presume is to take ownership a lot of times, that you were going to, uh, that this was a lucrative space and and you were, you know, sold yourself the dream and you found this, you didn't have a plan, then you probably should change your course, um, change, your, change your path to say the least. Now, I understood when getting into this that we were never going to be of value to anyone or anything unless we took care of the dogs. So our business model, isn't wrapped around making a bunch of money. It's about making change. Therefore, the more change we create, the more, the bigger the difference we can make. You know how long it takes to make a difference in something? Guys, it's not an overnight thing. 
And when you hear the word influencer, I've been influential on a lot of choices people have made over the past, we'll just say year. I won't give it anymore, just the last year. In posts, and context of posts, and the content and, and the attention that people are paying. Shout out to everyone who watches who don't even own a dog and just loves what we do. Like, I think when you cross that bridge even, you know how many people walk up to me and have walked up to me and I hate that I haven't gotten it all, but don't even own a dog but love what we do so much they have to watch. And this eye opening for me, wow. There are people that even look like me who appreciate representation and positive representation. Oftentimes, if we're being candid, when you think African Americans are black folk, you don't think that they actually do good business. You don't think that they actually stand for much or, or mean what they say. And the only thing I say, if I do say it, it's got to mean something. It's got to be of value. So when you say, hey, what's going to keep you guys alive in this? Because we, we don't think that we're doing anything special. We're not confused about what the business is. And the business is rooted in care. Now, my cousin years ago asked me a good question. And it was probably 3 o'clock in the morning in Kansas City. And we're sitting outside talking. And it's right by Bartle Hall. That's this venue here if you've been to Kansas City. And this fountain's going off. And we were just, we thought it was a nice, nice night. And we was just up talking, shooting the crap. And he said, Trev, how do you get people to care? Most times when you ask me a question, I'm pretty good at giving you an answer. Unfortunately, <laughs> I said, that's probably one of the hardest things on earth, man. But if they do, and if you are to get them to care, you have to care more than they ever think they could. And that in itself will inspire them often to do a little bit more. Now the reason, the challenge is, is actually knowing what to care about and how to care. How to convey care, how to communicate care, how to be consistent with care. But still, how do you get people to care? I say, here's the truth, my man. They may never care. And that's okay. Uh, but you got to stay true to the cause. So if you're sitting there and you're looking at your dog, Zara's laying next to my right right now, and you're thinking to yourself, I don't know how much longer I could do this. Well, if you did it on the pretense again of making a bunch of money, so-called breeding the biggest, baddest dogs, you should probably get out. That's the truth. If you did it because you love dogs, you enjoy making sure the dog has a healthy life, that the dog gets a fair chance to be the best dog possible, that it goes to places you're breeding to put it in homes that where it could change the dynamic and, and the structure of a house, then keep going. Because no matter what happens, whether if you sell your dogs for $200 or $20,000, every family who gets one of your dogs for those that care, they're going to be so grateful, and I assure you this, there is no money that can replace the love someone has for your program, for your pet, for pets, for dogs, for animals, uh, for whatever you're doing. And, and uh, one of the last messages I got from one of our guys was, uh, um, guys, I think his name's Ray. He says, just a wellness check, dog seven months. He says, man, he's big. He's doo -doo -doo -doo. Um, I saw another one where the guy is holding up Zara's daughter and he, JC sent me something over there out of Oregon. And, and uh, you know, you're just seeing this affinity based on, again, what we put out and how much we care. And I didn't do it asking for permission. I didn't do it asking for any guidance. I didn't do it because I thought we were doing something special. I thought everybody was supposed to care. I thought it was always supposed to be rooted foundationally and making sure the dog was good. And I always thought you were supposed to push the dogs because these are dogs. You do understand that, right? Technically, unless you're talking about a Pekingese or one of those Asian dogs back in the day, and I'm talking centuries, they were literally designed to sit on laps or in small cages to be looked at and admired. Unless you're talking about those dogs, they really, every dog, especially in the breeds we're talking about, they were designed to do something. But people are concerned, even at times, with what we do with our dogs. Oh, man, you better be careful with that. You go, my man, you, you worried about us having a good time and pushing our dogs because you think that if this dog gets hurt or it, it stops progress. Progress doesn't stop. Pain is just preparation for your destiny in the first place. Therefore, if our dogs do have a hiccup, which I've paid for. <laughs> I've paid for. A friend has helped me pay for. Nothing changes. 
Zara was able to hold two more litters and not tear our other ACL because of Chris Moore's assistance and giving us the shots we need to ensure her tendons tighten back up 99.9% .9 of the time. If a dog tears one knee, they're going to tear the other. And mind you, I repeat, I was just walking her. I actually know how to pace them back into getting healthy and, and, and not pushing them too far and assessing the whole time. I repeat, Zara had her first litter. She hadn't done too much of anything. I walked her on the concrete around the mile version at Arbor Hill and she began to limp. Then the limp got worse and it took longer to her. And I go, what is she, what's going on here? She, she's not even doing anything. And I pushed them based on each day's improvements and provision. In this case, did she get through a mile walk and was she okay? Yes. Let's put her in some water. How's she doing the water? She did good. Okay, let's see how, see, just start with some basic jumping stuff. See where she's jumping. Boom. Point is, our long-term goal is to create a dog that we love, we appreciate, we like, we enjoy, and others enjoy. But if you're thinking about quitting, I'll be honest with you, uh, you are what you what you think. I couldn't think about quitting because it was never about breeding a dog. It was about changing the dog world, being impactful in the dog world, being a teacher, and becoming an MVP in this dog world and making sure everyone around me also carry the MVP title because I've taught them, dang, this dog literally just, she won't move. She unplugged my light because she stretched out. Dogs, I tell you, she can't help it. She don't want to be nowhere else, but hey, I'm okay with that. Point is this, people. I don't want to have the conversation with you, any of you personally about what you should do moving forward, how to be successful in this dog space. What I will tell you is I'll teach you about community. I'll give you perspective on growing your brand and building your business. I'll give you concepts and ideas to think about to make whatever you're doing bigger. One of my kids, he died, Andre Maloney. And when his, uh, died on the football field and he was 17 years old, it was an MIB hashtag going on at the time and he used to say it it was like andre whatever it might be make it big and a lot of kids they were putting in i give them you don't know me but i'm a terror i just terrorize people that when i know the truth about them and so as we kid, i said i mean i ain't gonna say his name over here but <laughs> i said boy uh <clears throat> What'd you put, uh, make it bigger behind your name for? You ain't, you're gonna be big sitting on your couch. And, and these, these are high school athletes. I was terrorizing some of them kids because, you know, you get trendy and people get, but you don't have his work ethic. You don't have his purpose. You didn't have his mission. You didn't have his intent. You didn't have his desire to be better and not know what to do to get there. And it took me some personal time to even go reach, to talk to his mom. I'm saying all that to say, there have been moments where I too have thought of quitting many times, even when I was doing T-Fit. And every time I thought about quitting, especially early on, there was an identifiable conversation. There was a, a, a landmark where something changed the trajectory of my thoughts because I, at your point, if you're thinking this way, didn't understand this was bigger than a push-up, than a kid getting to college, than them playing in the NFL or NBA. This was so much more. And it took all that for me to come here and say, now I know what not to do. I know that if we get fixated on one dog, one idea, and, and one this, we're going to fail. But if we root this thing in value, our values, I said then things will change. People, listen, we'll talk more. Stay tuned. Take care of your dogs.